Hi, this is Dr. Crane, and welcome to field trip stop number three. So when we were at field trip stop number two, we saw that there were really young rocks that were uh, deeper within this valley than older rocks that were shallow, that were across the valley um, to the south. Okay. And, and here's a sketch uh, that was labeled and is available at the um, Arches National Park Visitor Center about the Moab Fault. So here's the Wingate Sandstone. That was that cliff former that we saw last time. Then there was the Chinle Formation, which was right underneath that. The Moenkopi, which was below that one. And then there was that Cutler Formation, which was kind of the purpley one that we saw in the outcrop and that was above the Honaker Trail, which was the very bottom gray one that we saw in the outcrop. Um, there's also a little bit, and it, it should reach the surface, this wavy unit right here, I think is the Paradox Formation, and that actually does kind of come to the surface up in here. It's not, it's not mapped that way on this visitor center sign. But the idea is that we go um, pretty old within the Jurassic, all the way down uh, through the Pennsylvania. On this side of the road, we've got the Entrada Sandstone, which again we said was pretty like middle of the road Jurassic, definitely younger than this Wingate up here. And that below that Entrada Sandstone, you had the Navajo, and then you had the Cayenta, and then you have Wingate and the Chinle, and you go down through there. Okay, so that means that this Wingate Sandstone used to be all the way up here matched up with this Wingate sandstone. Not that it was necessarily that this point, if I went and I collected a rock right there by that boundary, that that rock used to be right here next to this boundary, but that it was somewhere out in this valley and it has since dropped down. There's also been a lot of erosion, like these rocks probably came over uh, and we're adjacent to these and those have kind of eroded away. Okay, so these rocks have dropped down, which makes this a normal fault. Okay, so this side uh, has dropped down. This is our hanging wall and this is our foot wall. The way that the Park Service has this fault mapped, the Moab Fault, is that it stays on this side of the road through the Honaker Trail Formation, which if you think about it, that makes sense. The Honaker Trail and the Cutler that we saw in stop, stop number one, that uh, over here, that was really faulted. Okay, so if we think about a fault coming through here, sorry, a fault coming through here, we can see all these debris fans. It makes sense. Like That's the kind of thing that you see when a fault is disturbing that area, that a fault comes through here and comes out near field trip stop number one. But they don't really draw that this way. So instead of coming up through field trip stop number one, they kind of go down and they follow the road. They make it look like the fault comes through here, which I don't know if there's evidence of that or not. We definitely saw evidence of faulting uh, right here in field trip stop number one, and we saw that the fault was kind of oriented this way which would be what kind of like east-west but well would it be east-west this direction up here is northwest southeast okay so we saw some faults going like that but it doesn't make sense that it kind of follows the road completely so that's why we're going to have field trip stop number three because if we look in here, do y'all remember what we said about kind of weird pale gray to purple formations? Are these supposed to be old or young? Really old, right? Those are old formations when they're kind of weathered like that. And they're, they're not weathered and rounded like that because, necessarily because they're old, but because they contained a lot of evaporites. So that Honaker Trail Formation had gypsum, 
the uh, cutler didn't necessarily have uh, a lot of evaporites in it, but below Honecker Trail, if you went into the Paradox Formation, there's a lot of salt um, in the Paradox Formation. That's actually kind of what that formation is famous for in this area. Um, so this purple-gray area is one of those really old formations. And if we turn on the geologic map, we can see this kind of purple outline. That purple outline makes this part of the PP formation, which is the um, which is the paradox formation. Okay, so we've got paradox formation, and we have it right adjacent to Entrada sandstone. Entrada sandstone is really young, so we've got super young rock right next to super old rock. Let's Let's get down there and let's see what that looks like at Fisher. We'll stop my Fisher for a minute. Okay. Entrada. That's looking across the road. This is picking up on that gray unit. No! Why do I always click things? I swear. Oh, there's field trip stop number one. So this is kind of coming across the road. There's that gray unit. Now, here's the deal, y'all. When you were in intro geology and you learned about faults, they were pretty. They were searched like you probably originally learned about them as being lines, but they were clean, crisp surfaces within a block diagram where a hanging wall moved relative to a foot wall. In structure, you learned that pretty pictures aren't always realistic and that you can have kind of gross looking faults. You are looking at a gross looking fault. Okay? Really what you're looking at is a fault zone. So here's my old rock. Here's my young rock. When this young rock was dropping down, when this hanging wall was moving down and grinding and just pulverizing that boundary between the hanging wall and the foot wall, you form this region that's gross, that's just rock, that's a mix of gouge, which is kind of that clay-like material, and it's acting as a matrix. It's filling voids between bigger chunks of rock that are kind of worked around like chocolate chips in a weird, gross cookie dough matrix. Okay, so this area right here is the Moab Fault. And so here's a messy truth about faults. Faults don't always stay in one place. Okay, if we exit ground view, sometimes faults split. So if I were mapping this area, I would map the fault coming through here. I would probably map right here some kind of branching happens. So one comes out this way, I can sketch this on here. If it were me mapping, I would say there's probably a fault underneath these debris hills, these little fans. And part of that fault is coming out this way. And at some point, it branches and part of it's coming out that way and, do, and doing whatever when it gets over here. We haven't looked at that. That's what I would think is happening in some kind of a branch system. So for field trip stop three, you're not going to have um, anything to turn in. But what I want you to have taken from this is that you can be in an unfamiliar situation and you can figure out that something is going on. You can figure out that there's a fault. So from field trip stop one, when we started, we were kind of zoomed out. The first instinct you're gonna have is something doesn't look right about these rocks. Okay, there's a valley, rocks on both sides look different. Boom. 
then you need to investigate a little bit further. You can find local outcrops. You can see, is there a theme to how this deformation is taking place? Is there a theme to the types of structures that I'm seeing? And then you can try to find a vantage point to get a little bit more perspective and know your rock units. Is there anywhere where I'm not seeing a transition from old to young? Is there anywhere where all of a sudden I'm getting a young rock jumping in there lower than an old rock? It shouldn't be that way. You should never have an old rock, either if it's a thrust, thrust up on top of a young rock, or if it's a normal fault, a young rock that's shifted down relative to its older counterparts. Okay, and then from there, knowing your rock types, knowing your context, you work your way back in. Um, and you find, you look for these specific areas, these fault zones, to start sketching in. So if you were in the field, you would want to have that kind of flow of something's weird to find a hypothesis, to look for the things you would expect if that hypothesis were true. So I noticed that something's off on both sides of the road. My hypothesis is got to be normal faults. I've seen small scale normal faults. I see young rock juxtaposed down relative to old rock. To confirm that hypothesis, I need to go find a fault zone between those two units and between alluvial fans, seeing faults over here and this mess of a fault zone. That's enough for me to confirm that there's a normal fault in here or a branching normal fault as I've drawn it. So that's how, that's how I would maneuver in the field. Um, if I were working on the job here. So what you're going to do next, having gone on these field, three field trips, we understand that this area uh, is dominated by normal faulting. But that's not it. Okay, The normal faulting is actually part of this area uh, because it's part of a bigger picture of deformation. Okay, So over here, if we look at this line called cross-section 1, okay, we see rocks over here that look a heck of a lot like rocks over here. So we've got rocks this way, dipping, dipping over here, which is to the east. We see rocks over here dipping to the west. And they're the same rocks. That might start to give you an idea that maybe there's a really broad structure here. And we're kind of missing this inner area. Erosion might be help, you know, giving us this, this missing um, inner area. And these rocks do kind of look like they curve down a little bit. But overall, it's, I see them over here. I see them over here. I'm missing this stuff in the middle. So what I want you to do next is that I, I actually don't want you to construct a cross section of this one. Okay. What I want you to do is read about, uh, read about this area and why something like this might have happened. And then we are going to do a cross section construction on the cross section number two line. Okay. The reason why this should be weird is that there, uh, if, if this is the case, if this is an anticline, if you think back to structure, anticlines formed in situations most of the time where you had compressional tectonics, compressional stresses, where sigma 1 was oriented horizontally and it was pushing on those rock blocks and folding them up. That doesn't work in a scenario where you have normal faulting happening in kind of that same direction. Because in normal faulting, sigma 1 is oriented vertically. Okay. If the normal faults had not been oriented in the same um, direction as the anticlines, it, it wouldn't have been a big deal, really. I, 
you would be able to swap sigma 1, adjust it a little bit. So sometimes in nature we do see anticlines oriented perpendicular to normal faults. And that just means that sigma 1 is kind of flipping around a little bit. And that it's got a value that's kind of close to sigma 2. But if the two structures are oriented the same way, then that's a lot harder to achieve. At least if you think about it as the structure is trying to form in the same time period. And so this gets at a bigger issue in structure, and this is specifically why I wanted to bring you all to Moab virtually, is that in structure, you can't just think about place. And I'm sure for other disciplines of geology, that's true too. You can't just think about place. You have to think about time. So when you learned superposition in intro, you probably learned it as old rocks on top or old rocks on bottom, young rocks on top, right? We move up through time. Super important. But we also have to think about superposition in terms of structure. So if I have an anticline and I have normal faults and they are oriented in the same direction, so the hinge of this anticline would be oriented down through this valley, that fault is also oriented down through that valley. Those cannot be coeval. They cannot happen at the same time. So I have to start thinking about superposition. How would I have taken this anticline or this anticline over here and pulled it apart? Well, I would have had to form the anticline first and then have a normal fault. So that's your superposition of time in this particular area. You are going to form those anticlines during, actually during the laramide orogeny, which think late Cretaceous to early tertiary. You're going to use the laramide orogeny, that mountain building episode, to make these big anticlines going this way. And then Later, when that laramide orogeny stops, when it stops crunching those rocks together, when that pressure lets off, those rocks are going to start to relax. And as they relax, they're going to begin to cause faulting. So let's imagine we make an anticline right here. We push just gonna, I know that this is not the purpose of this tool, but I just want you to imagine. Imagine that these are the directions. Oh, that was bad. That this is the direction of stress during the laramide orogeny. That we're pushing these two directions, these two um, we're pushing in these two orientations in, we're making this nice big fold. Okay, and the Laramide made, made a huge mountain range, um, and it has since partially eroded, right? So this mountain, or this, this anticline, this big fold went up, and then when that pressure stopped, it relaxed. Okay, now let's think about the layers that are going on here. So we said that our upper layers are sandstones. Above that is kind of a mix of sandstone and limestone. And kind of below some of those sandstones, you also have limestones. But we said that the deeper we went down, the more evaporites we incorporate. We incorporate salts. We start to incorporate some gypsum as we go down in time, especially down in this paradox formation, which is full of salt, of halite. Okay, so we, we push this anticline together. It's got salt right in the middle of it. Salt is not as strong as rock. Salt deforms ductly. It flows. You can break it. It does have cleavage. But on shorter time scales than rock, salt starts to flow. It doesn't maintain shear stresses very well. So as that salt starts to flow and relax, 
we start to crack those rocks that are above it. And when we crack those rocks and we allow sliding and displacement to take place, that's where we start to get normal faulting. So let's think about how this process might continue. So I've cracked this open, and those cracks and those normal faults are going to act as pathways down into the subsurface. All right. So this is B to B prime. This is that cross section. So what happens with these cracks that go down into the subsurface is that they act as pathways for fluid. And as fluid, water, gets down there, what do you think happens with water and salt? Right? The salt goes into solution. So that salt is now even weaker than it was before, and it starts to flow and slide and open up this big Moab Valley that we see today. So again, Laramide orogeny, late Cretaceous to early tertiary, it makes this nice big anticline. You get relaxation, and that causes faulting and extension during the Cenozoic. Um, you also have some uplift due to the Colorado Plateau, but we're not going to get into that. When those rocks crack open, we allow water to reach these uh, rocks that are full of salt, right, which have already kind of flowed into the core of this anticline, into the hinge of the anticline, and that's where we start to get dissolution, and we get collapsing and tilting and faulting, and that continues through the tertiary and into the quaternary, and that's why those faults are still so crisp, is that the, the, the rocks are really old, but the, the normal faulting, and some of that normal faulting, is pretty recent. The normal faulting and, and the tilting, like we saw at stop one. Okay. So this is an important story of reactivation, that just because a structure forms one way, um, in the Cretaceous doesn't mean that there's going to be secondary structures or uh, a, a stratigraphic, um, what do we call it? Man, I was on a roll and now I'm not. That's okay, because this is how it would be in the field. <laughs> uh, but we're getting this stratigraphic relationships is what I'm trying to say. There's a stratigraphic relationship of structure that happens. And so we get the anticlines, they're superposed by normal faults, um, and we get this extension and the, the salt that flows up. I wanted you all to see a salt structure too, because if you go into industry, these are going to be really important um, structures. So this boundary between a rock that's full of salt and regular rocks, this boundary is not a normal boundary. This is called a trap. And so those normal, those you know, regular sedimentary rocks are kind of going to onlap onto the salt diapere or the salt core of the anticline, and this is going to create a space for hydrocarbons to get stuck. So I wanted you to have, to have seen one of these before. Your last assignment associated with MOAB is going to be to try your hand at a cross section along cross section line number one. So this is cross section line number one. You are going to use, if you just turn on geologic map, um, I'm going to turn some of these off and delete them so they are not in our way. This is cross section line number one. What I want you to do is focus less on these normal faults. Okay, these are not really, really deep penetrating normal faults. So if you don't want to include those normal faults in your cross section, don't. But the normal fault I do want you to include in your cross section is the one that we we saw and we decided a, a position on in field trip stop three. Okay, so you'll have the Moab fault. You'll have these units over here. Um, this is going to be your anticline. This is the J in formation, the Navajo sandstone, and you know what's below that. 
and then these are going up into the JK formation. So in here, you're going to see that dropped down position um, with the the rocks over here that are a little bit younger, and the rocks up here that are a little bit older. Uh, to get your topographic profile for this, you can use the geologic map if you want. Again, we'll provide that geologic map. Um, if it's easier for you, though, and you want to start with this instead, if you click on cross-section line, maybe this is cross-section line number two. Let's see. Oh yeah, okay, never mind. This is cross-section line number two. This is the one I want you to do. Go to show elevation profile. And that will give you your elevation profile across there. So you, you don't have to work as hard. If you wanna um, trace this on a piece of paper or print it, that's fine. Um, and I'll list in a separate document what I expect from your cross-sections. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye.